It is My Nerd World and Depeche Mode, the podcast. I'm your host, John Justice. Thank you so much for checking out the show. Been a couple of weeks since I've been able to uh, put out uh, an episode, but as we head into the uh, into the holiday season, things tend to get busy. And to be honest, there hasn't really been a whole lot of news to come out as of late since we got the details and the interviews with Dave and Martin after the announcement of Memento, Memento Mori. However, uh, I do have some details. I have an interview I've been sitting on for a little while, a little, a little while now, I'm talking about uh, Memento Mori. Also, we have some details about the Andrew Fletcher uh, tribute album that's out and available. If you um, Google um, six one two two Andrew Fletcher, you'll be able to uh, to find this compilation. Uh, from a lot of uh, bands that I haven't heard of before, um, but it is an Andrew Fletcher uh, tribute album. Also on the show this week, I, I found an old piece of audio that I haven't uh, covered uh, on the show before. It's Gary Newman talking about Songs of Faith and Devotion. Uh, this was a segment uh, that he did called, uh, I need to bring it up here, uh, What's in My Bag? And so they go to a record store, interview an artist, and they talk about the um, the albums that influenced them. And he spends a couple of minutes talking about songs of faith and devotion. Really enjoy um, this uh, this candid, short two minute discussion from uh, from Gary Newman, of course, of Cars fame, talking about this particular album. It relates to me as a fan because he experienced something with this uh, particular release that I think most of us have experienced. Um, with Depeche Mode and our connection with this band. So I'll share that with you uh, coming up in uh, in just a moment. As always, you can email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com. Uh, you can also find that at uh, mynerdworld.net. Uh, but let's start off here. Uh, a few details of this uh, Depeche Mode tribute comp- uh, compilation, 6122, uh, a tribute to Andy Fletcher of Depeche Mode. On May 26, 2022, Andrew Fletcher, founding member of Depeche Mode, passed away at age 60. Um, the On November 25th, the Depeche Mode tribute album, so this has been out now for about a week or so, 6122, an Andrew, uh, to Andrew Fletcher of Depeche Mode was released. The compilation's title contains the year Andrew Fletcher was born and the year that he died. The aim was to bring together different artists from different decades old musical companions of Fletch, as well as known artists across different genres and promising new bands who were influenced um, by uh, Depeche Mode sound. The two-CD set features artists from all kinds of musical genres, and 50% of all the profits will be donated to a charity organization for children in the UK and the Children's Cancer Trust in Germany, who officially partners uh, with the project. Um, behind this project, um, they find uh, Daniel Gurky of uh, the act The Brute. So again, if you search for uh, Depeche Mode tribute compilation 6122 uh, to Andrew, uh, Andrew Fletcher of Depeche Mode, you can go and uh, and check it out. I've heard a few of these tracks and they're okay. I'm generally not the biggest fan of covers of Depeche Mode. I, I think I just, I don't know how it is for you, but for me, I, I love Depeche Mode so much that I just... I have a hard time hearing other individuals' interpretations of their music and enjoying uh, and enjoying them. There are a few that I that I do like. Um, Lacuna Coils, uh, enjoy the silence. I enjoy quite a bit. There was the um, there was the tribute album that came out a number of years ago. My gosh, this was like what two thousand one, and there were some pretty good tracks on that as well. Um, specifically, the Cure was on there, and that was that that was pretty decent. But again, I just. I, generally speaking, I don't gravitate towards the covers uh, for Depeche Mode songs. I much prefer the original uh, versions. Uh, on a side note, before I dive into this article uh, called uh, Depeche Mode Life for Two, uh, where we uh, get some Q&A from uh, Martin Gore and Dave Gaughan during the uh, promotion of Memento Mori after the, uh, after the announcement, uh, I had an interesting thing happen lately. Uh, and, I, and I don't know if it happens for you, but I think we all have our favorite Depeche Mode albums, and we have the ones that we don't listen to very often. Uh, we have the songs on particular albums that we don't find quite as strong, uh, and we don't necessarily gravitate towards them. There are these rare occasions, though, and typically it happens when 
and I've probably gone down this road before. So if you listen to the podcast and I've done this rant, I apologize, but I don't remember just because there's been so much distance between a lot of these podcasts. But typically it happens when I just decide I'm going to put an album on as opposed to going and listening to um, a playlist of Depeche Mode songs that I happen to have like on my on my iPhone. Uh, This happened recently. I was doing some cleaning of my office slash bedroom slash studio. I knew it was going to take some time. So I I just started putting some some Depeche Mode albums on. And in particular, I put on Delta Machine. And this is not an album that I go back to very often. There are tracks on it that I really love, Broken and Angel being uh, two of them. But uh, there's a lot of tracks on that album that I just find are kind of weak. And I... They don't end up making it onto playlists like on my iPhone of what I listen to. But man, I put that on and just found myself as I was doing this cleaning and this other work, just really, really getting into these songs that I typically, if you had asked me, I said I didn't really care for. I really end up loving them. And I ended up putting on Sounds of the Universe, which is an album that I actually really enjoy. But again, there are tracks on there like Hold to Feed that I never thought that I would actually be be like rocking out to, for lack of a better term. And here I was. I was. I was like stunned. And I don't know if it was the fact that I wasn't thinking about it. I don't know if it's because typically when I go to listen to Depeche Mode, I'm 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 going to listen to something specific because I'm in a particular mood and so without the without the um preconceived rationale for going and listening to a particular track I just ended up finding myself more open to the the song in and of itself but I just I was stunned cuz Hold to Feed is probably like one of my least favorite Depeche Mode songs and again um here I was thoroughly enjoying it in a way that I never have before. So uh, if that's happened to you, I'd love to, I'd, I would love to hear from you. I just, that typically doesn't, doesn't happen for me. So, all right, let's get into this. Um, Depeche Mode Life for Two. Uh, again, uh, talking about what to expect in uh, Memento Mori. Uh, I believe this is specifically with uh, Dave Gone, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it is. This is an interview specifically with Dave Gone. So I want to share with you uh, some of the Q&A here. So, Um, What changes as it relates to the passing of Fletch? Um, The announcement of Andrew Fletcher's death on May 26th plunged Depeche Mode fans into an abyss of of perplexity. Could the group exist without one of its founding members? We asked ourselves the question, admits Dave Gone, but we had already started recording our our next disc when we learned of his death. And we felt we had to continue. Fletch was Martin's uh, constant support, notes Gone. He was even sometimes his spokesperson within the collective, but he hadn't been involved in the creative process for a long time. Uh, what memento will look what uh, what memento Mori will look like the group's next album? Um, we are an electro group recalled gone during the Berlin press conference. The disc is almost finished. He continues. Uh, there will be twelve songs, including three composed by me. Uh, And the album will be released in March. There has been um, some talk about when the single will come out. Most people have dismissed any chance of it coming out this year. A lot of people have been pointing to, I believe, January or February. By February, I would imagine we'll get the first single, whatever that will be. I think January is when we got Where's the Revolution off of Spirit. If not, it was certainly in February, but I think it was in January. Um, Again, the title, uh, Memento Mori, Remember That You Are Going to Die, was found by Martin a month before the death of uh, of Fletch. For Martin, this title is, above all, a celebration of life, which shows that you have to take full advantage of it as long as you're still there. This 15th album is the first entirely made for two. It's a new era for us, but the important thing for me is to make music with Martin. Just coming to sing his songs would be... Uh, pointless. No, I need to talk to him about my ideas, about my proposals, even if he clearly explained to me that he wanted to remain the author of the majority of the compositions. And I thought that was interesting, even if he clearly explained to me that he wanted to remain the uh, author of the majority of compositions. And I, that is an interesting dynamic, and I would be 
curious to hear if Martin would be willing to go and explore that further about why he wants to be the chief songwriter, if you will, as opposed to perhaps having a release that is split evenly between uh, Martin and uh, and Dave. Um, why stadiums rather than arenas? Uh, let's face it, if Depeche Mode impresses um, in theaters, 20,000 places, uh, seat places like Bercy, the group has often disappointed in the stadium, they write, uh, due to the sonography not suited for gigantism. The Memento Mori Tour's first stop will be in America uh, for 10 dates in are- arenas before arriving on May 16th in Europe. We have a disc to finish before preparing the tour, explained Martin Gore in Berlin. But Anton Corbin is already working on proposals for visuals, images, and videos. We will enter this process once the album is finished. Dave Gone, he says um, that uh, I dive back in each time in our discography to see what we could unearth. The new titles must mesh well with the old ones. There are songs like Sun and the Rainfall, which we haven't played since the 1980s and which could give us a chance this time around. If only 42 concerts have been announced, um, it's already rumors of a second salvo of dates. Is this the last chapter? No. A new one smiles Dave gone. Music makes me feel good. Doing it with someone is the source of comfort for me. I know how uh, destructive success could have been uh, for not measuring how lucky I am to still be here to still live for the music. For us, this duo step is interesting because it pushes us to find another way of working. Uh, you will see, you will be surprised. So again, a lot of this is um, information that we've um, shared on the show before um, and you've probably seen in the interviews done with the band since um, the announcement of Memento Amori. But I was hanging on to the interview and I wanted to, uh, to share it with you. Before I play this uh, piece of audio from Gary Newman, I want to mention too that two things really stuck out from those uh, press interviews uh, with Martin and Dave. One was Dave's reluctance. Actually, three things. One was Dave's reluctance to head back out on tour. Um, it was the most negative, for lack of a better a better word, or unenthusiastic that I've seen Dave in all the interviews that they've done for the launch of albums. It's sort of questioning being able to go back out on tour and... Uh, whether or not he still wanted to go and do this. Um, I'm encouraged by the fact that he seems very excited about this particular record. And based off of the little that we've heard, I can kind of understand why. Like the more time that I spend with the the snippets um, of the songs, you know, the more kind of excited I get to hear what the rest of this um, you know album is going to end up, or what the album is going to end up really sounding like, only hearing these small snippets. Out of all the snippets that the band has released before the album has come out, that one grabs me more than any of them. I mean, this goes back to hearing samples from um, Exciter, from playing the Angel. I mean, basically all the all the albums have had some type of you know samples that have come out beforehand, but specifically so- uh, the Sounds of the Universe and uh, and Exciter. And that one sample just uh, man. I, I just I can't I am dying, dying to hear that song. Uh, the other the two other items I wanted to mention, and then I'll play you this Gary this Gary Newman clip. The two other items I wanted to mention was uh, Dave was interviewed uh, uh, in one of these uh, press conference interviews. Uh, he was asked about Alan. It was uh, Alan Wilder, and it was really funny because Dave kind of pointed out just how long it's been since Alan Wilder's been in the uh, in the band, and was very sort of kind of perplexed and confused and dismissed, you know, that, you know, it's been a long time. Um, It's been a long time since Alan's been in the band and then he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be coming back. The last thing was Martin. And in numerous interviews, Martin talked about turning 60 and how difficult it was for him 
turning 60 and how he began to really question his mortality from a, a very personal perspective. Um, I know exactly how Martin feels. I'm not 60. I turned 50 in July, but having to go through, as I've talked about on the show and I, I just mentioned it briefly, having, ha- having gone through this, this, um, this third open heart surgery that I had to go through and having lost Fletch, as I talked about in previous episodes, and then um, more importantly, uh, losing my best friend, um, Andrew, in June, uh, when I turned 50, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I know exactly what Martin was feeling like turning 60. I found it encouraging, though, because here's a band that I look up to, that I admire, that has been such a huge part of my life, an individual who's written these lyrics that have touched me in, you know, ways that, you know, I could spend every podcast. I could spend a a weekly podcast just going through song lyrics and, and the impact that they've had on me personally. Uh, and to hear Martin talk about 60 being that for him, and I'm looking at it from a 50 perspective, I found really, really encouraging in an odd bizarre way but you could just see it in martin's face and i thought it was fascinating from the angle that martin has written so many lyrics about death especially early in his career that like i have a hard time i was having a hard time going through that period over the summer of turning 50 and listening to black celebration and hearing lyrics like death is everywhere or death's door and it was because I was having difficulty at the time. And so I wonder for Martin, what kind of inspiration, which has me even more curious for the content of this album, what kind of inspiration did Martin have for writing this time around, hitting 60 and having it impact him the way that it did? Because I imagine that it did, and especially with The album title being Memento Mori and what Memento Mori means, Remember You Have to Die, and hearing Martin talk about how difficult it was for him turning 60 has me excited for the content of this album because I feel like when Martin's able to tap into something very emotional and at an early, at a young age, you've got a lot of different influences going on, right? But when you're getting older, you get into routines and things become a little bit more normal. But now that he's dealing through this, I'm I'm uh, genuinely curious to see how that impacted him as it relates to the songwriting coming up on the on the album. <laughs> All right, so let me play you this clip. Here's Gary Newman on the YouTube show, What's in My Bag. This is from nine years ago, be that as it may. Still incredibly relevant to any Star Wars fan, in my opinion. Uh, Next one, Depeche Mode, obviously. An album called Songs of Faith and Devotion. I first met or come across Depeche Mode, 1979, I think it was. And they were playing in some little nightclub on the floor. Nobody ever heard of them, and I thought they were great. And I tried to sign him to Beggar's Bankrupt, and somebody told me that he'd already signed him to someone else. It turned out to be a lie, really. So I actually, I almost could have been the person that signed to Pesh Mode. How cool would that have been? But I didn't. But I stayed in love with him ever since, and my career was in a real bad place in 92, 90, between 92 and 94. And my wife got me this album uh, for the first time, and it changed everything for me. It's a fantastic album. Uh, it made me love music again. It was, I didn't realise I'd sort of fallen out of love with it and I hadn't enjoyed it for some time and it was hearing this that made me realise somehow and I went back to music with a different attitude after this album. I went back, it went back to being a, a hobby, something I did for the love of it rather than thinking about radio and A&R men and all that stuff. Ever since I listened to this album my music has been much heavier, much darker and more inventive again and if I follow it all back it goes right back to this Alan Wilder was in the band when this was made. He was now a really good friend of mine, so I, I regularly say thank you to him because he, probably more than anything, this is the album that's, that got me through that period and is why I'm still around at the moment. I just, there was something so genuine about that, you know, that little snippet of an interview with, with Gary Newman, and it brought me back to when. Songs of Faith and Devotion came out. 
and at the height of my Depeche Mode <laughs> fandom in the 90s, going to Hyde Park Corner in Southern California. I think it was in Yorba Linda. I could be getting wrong where that location was. But it was a little import record shop in Orange County. And my first exposure to what Songs of Faith, Faith and Devotion was going to be was, I believe it was The Enemy, but it was a black and white photograph of Dave Gone. First that I'd seen of him since the um, overdose had uh, had taken place, right? Uh, or was this pre-overdose? This had to be pre-overdose, right? Yeah, this was this was pre-overdose. My bad. Um, yes, definitely pre-overdose. I'm getting my days mixed, my my years mixed up. So this was the first we'd actually seen of Dave looking like this at all. But he had on the vest. Without a shirt underneath, you saw the tattoos, the goatee, and the long hair. And I was just like, whoa, what in the world is going on here? And talking with, I'll never forget, talking with the guy at the counter and mentioning to him how surprised I was to see how Dave looked. And this was before we heard any music. And then talking about how I was hoping that the record, the album, whatever, had more than nine songs because I wanted it to be longer than Violator based off of how much I loved Violator. And then, of course, just hearing I Feel You for the first time and just being open to how it sounded. I don't think if it hadn't been for Depeche Mode, I would have heard I Feel You and enjoyed it but being that it was Depeche Mode, I wanted to give this song, you know, every chance I could and just being sort of shocked by how different it was. And then and then within a few listens, just immediately falling in love with it as I did that whole album. Between Songs of Faith and Devotion and Violator, you know, two of my favorite albums of the band, if you asked me which one I had to pick, and I could only pick one. I probably would go with Songs of Faith and Devotion. It's tough because there's just something that I love about Violator, that moment in my life in the 90s. But, you know, Songs of Faith and Devotion just has that depth to it that just, you know. And I've gone on at length about this before, and now I'm rambling on. So I'll, I'll move on from there. But that's what that's why that nine-year-old clip from Gary Newman was so um, important and impactful for me, just because... He was sharing what that album did for him, and I just remember at that period in my life again, there was a lot that I was going through that I'm certainly not going to get into on the podcast, but especially as it relates to my faith and um, the love I have of other people, and there was just a lot going on, and that album was was there for, was there for me um, in a way that it was there for uh, for Gary Newman. <laughs> All right, let's get to your listener feedback. I got a lot of emails here that I've been holding on for the past couple of weeks, and I thank you for everybody who's written in uh, to talkshownerd at gmail.com or left a comment up on YouTube. So first, we'll hear from uh, Stephanie in Germany. Uh, Thanks again for your great podcast. I feel very uplifted uh, being a fan. I've seen the interviews, too, and I found it heartbreaking how Dave talked about the relationship with Fletch and that he misses him sorely. Really impressive. Also, the interview with Martin, and you know what I learned from Depeche Mode. They taught me a little self-confidence. I grew up in the uh, provinces, and it wasn't so easy to stand up for uh, which band you belong to because many people followed the mainstream in the 90s, all the boy bands. I had nothing against them, but I didn't like them much either. And then to stand by the fact that you uh, now follow a completely different musical direction and also philosophy was sometimes not so easy. But Depeche Mode were just like a wake-up call for me. As I mentioned before, they were a bit different and so was I. So we belonged together. Um, and I always notice it was worth it because this Depeche Mode family is just something very special, and to exchange with fans who treat you completely non-judgmental is just wonderful. Amen to that. That's all for now. I hope you're doing well, and you'll be doing even better. Many love greetings from Germany, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. 
Um, friend of the show, John Justice, who I've had a John J O H N Justice, who I've had the opportunity to speak with uh, personally over the course of the past few weeks. I trust he's doing well. Says hearing Memento Mori is going to have several songs about death. Thinking Black Celebration tracks might be in the running as it relates to what um, the playlist might look like. And man, hearing what Metallica is doing. They're two nights back to back and no repeats. My gosh, I wish Depeche, I wish Depeche Mode would do that. How amazing would that be to have Depeche Mode do what Metallica? And if you don't know what what this is, so Metallica's going out on tour later in the year, next year into 2024. They have a new album coming out. They already released the single. I'm jealous. I wish Depeche Mode had done that. But they're going to be doing two night stints, and they won't be repeating any of the tracks over the two nights. And based off of how big Depeche Mode's um, catalog is, man, I wish they would do that. That would be amazing. All right. Um, the Lily Pillies writes, really hope they shake up the set list a bit this time. They have such a vast repertoire. Um, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce the name here. I believe it's writ- written written in Russian, and I have no idea how it even approach that. Thank you for writing in, though you know who you are. If I was Depeche Mode, they write, I would make a playlist with songs like Stories of Old, Lie to Me, Nothing, Stripped, Sister of Night, Insight, Sacred, If You Want, and remove the classics like Enjoy the Silence and Personal Jesus. This will be a special tour only for real fans wanting an entirely new experience. It's not about money or something they should be more... It's not about money or something. They should be more brave with 30 years playing Enjoy the Silence, Never Let Me Down Again, and Personal Jesus. And this goes back to what I mentioned. I mean, that that to me would be amazing. If they did multiple nights and they said, hey, we're going to do like a best of night where they do all the classics that everybody expects. And then they do uh, a second night, no singles. Oh, that would be amazing. I'm excited just thinking about it. But I've mentioned this before. I do dream set lists in my mind. Like if I had the band in front of me and they asked John Justice, hey, we want you to write the set list. We want you to do the set list. We want you to handle the visuals and uh, just beginning to end. I mean, I have entire concerts laid out in my mind. And I hear particular older tracks and being like, oh, my gosh, how great would it be if they opened up a concert with my joy? Oh, it would be amazing. But, I mean, I do that. With so many sort of B-side songs that they've done, I just kind of go, oh my gosh, wouldn't it be incredible if they opened the show with Ice Machine? <laughs> All right, I have a fantasy world that I live I live with uh, in my head. Uh, that fantasy world, though, that I live with in my head, I decided to take and uh, put down on uh, paper, and I did that. When I decided to write my science fiction space opera series, so listen, if you uh, if you like science fiction, I hope that you will uh, treat yourself or a family member uh, and uh, check out my science fiction space opera series. It's set in the future where air and space flight culture has replaced car culture. It was inspired in part by Depeche Mode, life in a so-called space age, the world we live in, life in general. Depeche Mode plays a large part in the underlying themes of the story, and the main character himself is a massive Depeche Mode fan. At a time in the future when the music of the 80s through the 2000s is nostalgic and popular among the characters. Uh, The stories feature references to Depeche Mode, both direct and indirect, while telling an exciting science fiction space opera saga. The description for book one is as follows. As Earth faces its end, the fight to rule the stars begins. Katha Morrow knows fellow pilot Taft Guardia has feelings for her, but after the passing of her aerospace engineer father, she focuses solely on her flying skills. When a D-Corp civilian and military spacecraft factory suffers a catastrophic industrial accident, Katha receives a cryptic message from her past. Unaware of the apocalyptic chain of events, Taft agrees to help investigate. Meanwhile, the ruthless Sin Argum of D-Corp attempts to exploit the global evacuation. Taft and Katha will need each other more than ever after discovering what may be the key to saving humanity from the tyranny of D-Corp's evil leader. If you like your science fiction epic filled with some romance and action, Embark is perfect for you. Written for adults, but great for ages 11 years and older. Pick up and bark book one today, available in ebook, hardcover, paperback, and audiobook. Just head on over to Amazon.com, search for 
Embark, John J O N Justice, or MyNerdWorld.net. Uh, Again, uh, Amazon.com, Embark, John J O N Justice, or MyNerdWorld.net. Uh, I hope you'll, uh, you'll. Again, pick up your preferred copy of my book. If you like science fiction, obviously you like Depeche Mode, I think you'll really, uh, you'll really enjoy these. All right, uh, that uh, wraps up the show for this week. Went on a heck of a lot longer than I expected. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did recording it, by the way. Talkshownerd at gmail.com, or if you happen to be listening up on YouTube, you can leave a uh, comment there as well. So don't know when I'll have a new episode. I'll try to squeeze a new one in before Christmas. How's that sound? All right. Thank you so much for checking out the show again this week. We'll talk to you again real soon. Bye. My Nerd World.